Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. May 22nd, 2018. The Kuna Report is powered by Kelly Financial Services. Cleaning up your financial bull. Get the peace of mind that you deserve at Kelly Financial Services. Two oh five here on the Great WRKO. Okay, my friends, a very quick reminder: we've got Andrew Pollack coming on at two twenty. He is the father of Meadow, who was killed by Nicholas Cruz in the Parkland shooting massacre. He is going to speak out about what he thinks about this huge push for gun control. You don't want to miss it. Also, this Thursday, 415, we're going to be holding a huge rally demanding the removal of Judge Feely. Please join me if you can. It's going to be held at the J. Michael Ruane Judicial Building. That's where Feely works on Federal Street in Salem. It starts at 415. You can also, if you want, take the train. You get off at the Salem stop. It's about five minutes away, walking distance, very close, on the commuter rail, the Rockport-Newberryport line. Okay, quick reset. Starbucks is now in a huge mess. Uh, they have now introduced a new policy, basically an open doors policy, an open borders policy, if you want to put a national spin to it, whereby anybody can come in and use their restroom. You don't have to be a paying customer. Homeless people are now going in. Drug addicts, drug dealers are now going in. Customers are fleeing and complaining. And the question is this. Do people have the right to use any bathroom of any establishment that they want, is Starbucks making a huge mistake, or do you agree with it? We had Leon before. We had to go to break. She is the owner of an establishment herself. She tried to be nice. She allowed a homeless person to use her bathroom, and she kept coming back and coming back, and then there was a mess made in the bathroom. It's very unsanitary, and so now Lee is telling us she's going to have to put up a sign no public restroom, and she was building up to a brilliant point about liberal legislators. Lee, I had to ca cut you off. Take it away, Lee. Thank you, Jeff. No, I understand um, the break, but uh, let me just say, I, I am reluctant to place a sign on my door stating no public restroom simply because, you know, the type of clientele that I get, they're nice people and a lot of older folks and all that. And I don't want anybody to think that where I have my establishment is a seedy neighborhood. It's not. It's like Brittany, any other neighborhood, any other city. There are places that the homeless go to because the services are there. I come from a community where we have multiple, multiple services for homeless people. And let me just say, Jeff, that I'm involved in organizations that, and I serve on boards, that help people that are in a position where they, you know, they need services. But I'm also sympathetic to other business owners like me who are sort of running the show by themselves. I feel for the Starbucks employees because corporate is somewhere else. They're telling the Starbucks employees, let anybody with this new policy, let anybody come and use the restroom. It's okay. But the employees are the ones that have to clean it up. They're not going to have a janitor come in and clean the restrooms. I know how it how it works. But here's the larger thing. Somebody's going to come along and somebody's going to say, we need to make this a policy right across the board. So any establishment with more than five tables or more than 10 seats will have to do this. Trust me, I was also a legislator, so I know this. And the other thing, too. What people don't understand, Jeff, is that a lot of homeless people who want to use a shower or a restroom for $10 a month, they join like Planet Fitness or Workout World, and they go in there every day and they shower and they use the restroom and maybe they work out. But I know homeless people that have joined for $10 a month simply because they can't afford a $2,000 a month apartment but they can afford 
to shell out ten dollars a month to use those facilities lee can i ask you something and look sure. you, you sound like a an extremely responsible business owner and a very nice woman so please don't take this the wrong way you know what i don't understand i don't understand this from many small business owners in particular uh, you're very eloquent, very articulate, but you're going on about, you know, you care about the homeless, you help the homeless, you work for homeless causes. And I don't understand why business owners need to feel to apologize or feel the need to be apologetic to show that they're compassionate. With all due respect, Lee, it's your business. You work at it every day. It's, you know, you put the risk behind it. If it goes under, you go under. You work. It's your business. You take all the risk. You've raised the money. You pay the bills. You run the staff. You put out the work. You put in the long hours. You, you know, your responsibilities to the customers. It's your business. If you don't want anybody to come into your business, forget being homeless, forget being drug addicts, forget whatever. That's your right. And I don't understand yeah. why business owners don't just say, look, it's my business. I work at it. I built it. It, you know, it rises or falls based on my work. Who is the government or in this case, corporate? I mean, I know technically they own it, but you know, you got to think about the customers. Lee, I'll tell you the truth. I wouldn't want to go to your establishment. I just wouldn't. If I see homeless people lying on the floor or people shooting up in the bathroom, I, I wouldn't. So you're going to go under, Lee. I'm telling you, if, if you know, you, you adopt this policy, you're gone. So why should you be apologetic? I don't understand that. Could I, could I respond to yes, that? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so I, first of all, number one, I'm not apologetic. I am a conservative. I volunteered in my community long before I ever had my establishment, but I have put my foot down. It's no Miss Nice Girl anymore. The restroom is not open to anybody but my customers, and I can do that right now, Jeff. I fear, and I apologize to no one, and there are homeless people through unfortunate circumstances that are homeless, and there are homeless people that get there all by themselves. And I make no apology, no apology. And I have put my foot down, but I fear that somebody's going to come along with some legislation. Oh, you're a thousand that's percent going right. To hurt us. Oh, Lee, you're a thousand. No, please, Lee, don't take it. I wasn't criticizing you. I was just, I get that a lot from business owners. You know, they're always like, look, you know, I care. I'm compassionate. I'm this. And I'm like, look, I'm sure you are. Of course. You sound like a very sure. nice woman. But I'm thinking, and like, look, Jeff, even if you're not, Lee, really, honestly, even if you're not, it's your business. Yes, yes. I mean, and honestly, Lee, it's your business. So right. to me, look, look I'm not going to lie to you. You know, have there been a few moments in my life where I rushed in to go to the bathroom at a McDonald's or whatever and didn't buy something? Yes. For the most part, if I do, I will buy something because I just feel I owe it. But what Starbucks is now doing is, frankly, it's insulting and it's threatening their customers. And Lee, this I is what I don't get. Okay, honestly, I don't get this. You got a business, take Starbucks big money it's got a great brand it's got a product that people love it's making money profit hand over fist if it ain't broke don't fix it why do they have to inject this liberal lunacy and now all of a sudden starbucks is in big trouble it makes no sense to me and can i just say one make one last yes point yes personally? Lee. yes I have um, I have many nieces and nephews, and at Christmas time, I get them either Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks because I know a lot of them are on their way to work in the morning, and they stop at those places. I can tell you, Jeff, I will be boycotting personally, boycotting Starbucks. I don't go there. I I, I make my own coffee in the morning, and I go to work. But and I have favorite places that I go to. But I will get my message across, and I, in that way, and I will never buy a gift certificate there from there again. And I think what they're doing is unfair to their employees because their employees are the ones that are going to have to clean up after it. And after oh, Lee, the, you're making so many brilliant points. Lee, I got to go, but I, can I ask you one final question? Thank you so much. Lee, yes. do you want? I want to put some money in your pocket because you sound like such a nice woman. Do you want to give out the name and address of your business, or you don't yes. have to if you don't want to? Thank you so so much for that, Jeff. 
but I don't want to use this forum as okay. a an ad for my business. No, I no, I know you didn't mean it. You didn't. Int- I'm just saying, really, oh, you sound no, like no. such a nice woman and such a responsible business owner. I'm like, aha, a fellow conservative. Let's send some <laughs> customers her way. Thank you so much, Jeff, and and I truly, truly appreciate it. But it's a pleasure and an honor for me to be able to have this much time when I know there are other people waiting, and I thank you for doing Lee, that. God bless you. And don't be a stranger. Call again. Okay, I promise we'll take more of your calls. Coming up next, though, you got to hear this interview. Andrew Pollock lost his daughter, Meadow, in the Parkland Massacre. He is now saying this liberal drive for gun control is insane and as a father who lost a victim who lost a loved one he's saying enough is enough don't miss the interview next 220 here on the great wrko okay my friends as you know we have a lot of guests on this show but it is truly my distinct honor and privilege to have on uh mr andrew pollock He lost his daughter, Meadow, in the Parkland Massacre. He is also the founder of AmericansForChange.org. Oh, forgive me, uh, AmericansClassForChange.org. Mr. Pollock, thank you so much for coming on the Kuna Report. All right. No no problem. It's AmericansForClass. Org. Americans for class dot org. My my apologies, Mr. No Pollock. Um, no first of all, I want to offer you my deepest condolences. As a parent, I can't imagine what you must be going through right now, uh, losing your wonderful, beautiful daughter. And uh, Mr. Pollock, I just want to ask you: in the wake now of another shooting in Texas, there continues to be a growing call for gun control. Do you think gun control is the answer? If so, why? If not, why not? Gun control is not the answer because gun control wouldn't have stopped either one of the shootings. Okay? Because in Texas, there, there was no gun law that would have prevented this kid from getting those guns. The father should, was irresponsible of leaving his guns out. So there's no law that would have prevented it. In Florida, there was gun laws in place to prevent it. And they didn't they didn't follow through on it, the authorities. The police were through his house over thirty five times and didn't arrest him one time. If he if this psychopathic criminal was arrested once, he wouldn't have been able to buy a weapon. So the gun laws were in place. In school there's another forty incidences of him being a psychopath, carving swastikas into the table in the lunchroom, threatening kids' lives. If they would have acted on it and had him Baker acted, he never would have been able to buy a weapon. So the gun laws were in place. So whoever's out there saying it's the gun laws, that's not, it's not the gun laws. Uh, Mr. Pollock, I, you're at the White House, I believe, correct? No, no, I was in Manhattan. Now I'm at the airport because I'm going to fly. I'm, on, uh, I'm going to be flying out to Texas to meet with. Oh, the okay. Family. I'm sorry because I was hearing this noise in the background, and I'm thinking, are you at some event in the yeah, White House? I'm, my mistake, my no, bad. I'm in the. I wish I was at the. I'd rather <laughs> be at the White House than flying to Texas to go visit some other parents that lost their kids. Um, Mr. So, Pollock, I'm just for, curious. Uh, sure. Um, what do you make of the likes of David Hogg and uh, Mrs. Gonzalez and others who are going on CNN, going on MSNBC, giving speeches, saying that gun control would have prevented your daughter's death? Are they politicizing Meadows' death? Well, I just told you that the laws were in place. You know what I mean? Uh, if, if you, like, what They've been to his house, like I told you, over 35 times. If they would have arrested him once... The gun laws were in place to prevent him from buying a weapon. But as far as David goes, I know David. I had him at my house. And he has an agenda. I'm okay with his agenda. That's what he wants to do with his time. I met with him. I don't, no one's going to tell me what to do. And uh, if he wants to go pursue that angle, if I had to, you know, let him do it. I, I don't have a problem with it. Not every kid uh, feels the same way as David, but he's entitled to his opinion. Um, Mr. Pollock, your group, yes. AmericansForClass.org, what is it about? Yes. Uh, it's, a, it's a way that I'd like uh, the way the schools to be secure. There's, there's things on there that parents could get involved with right away 
to make their schools safer. And, and if they got on my on the website, they could see what they could do. You know, we have a, a class watch that we're, we're currently working on in Coral Springs. Class watches uh, parents are going to be able to volunteer in the mornings when the school, kids go to school. And when they get out of school, there'll be a, a deterrent at the school. You know, so we're working on that. Uh, that's what parents can do right now that want to volunteer. But my main thing, if anyone's listening out there, if they want to bring any type of change in their community, if they're not happy with their school or what's going on with the security or their curriculum, they got to get involved at a local level. Uh, I, I met with everybody, from the president, vice president, all his cabinet members, senators, governors. The only control that a community has, the most control is at its school board level. They control all the money and they control uh, what, what's done for safety at, the, at, at a local level. So that's what we're working on in Broward because we're so messed up in Broward with the policies. They have these PC policies in place that led up to this, uh, I call them 18, 19, 58, for getting, uh, for not, never getting arrested and being able to purchase a rifle. So if you're concerned about your community, you have to get involved uh, at that level, school board. Okay. Uh, Mr. Pollock, it's uh, a lot of noise in the background. It's hard to hear you. But... Yeah, I'm sorry. It's no, no, it's not your fault. Listen, look, yeah, again, it's on that loudspeaker, so that's you know okay. I mean. Mr. Pollock, I want to, again, my deepest condolences and best of luck sure. to you. And he is the founder of AmericansForClass.org, a great organization. Mr. Pollock, have a safe flight and God bless you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll talk soon. All right. Thanks take care. Again. Take care. Bye-bye. 617-266-6868 is the number. Uh, sorry about the audio quality. It just couldn't be helped. He was at the airport. But uh, look, I, I feel for him, and I think he's dead on. Uh, I thought he was being very gracious regarding David Hogg. I would have been much tougher on him if I were in his shoes, but that's up to him. Obviously, he's lost a daughter, and he's grieving, and I don't want to criticize him because he's got the right to his opinion as well. I would just say this. He is a 1,000% correct. Had um, that animal, had Nicholas Cruz been arrested even once, even once, all the times the police came to his house, all the times he was shooting up animals and pets of his neighbors, uh, all the threats that he kept making to that school, all of his outrageous behavior, had he just simply been arrested once, he never would have been able to buy those guns, the shooting never would have occurred, and this man's daughter would be alive today. And to me, and I wanted to ask him this, but just you can't hear him because of the loudspeakers. To me, how that sheriff, the leader of the cowards of Broward County, Sheriff Israel, how this guy still has a job is honestly beyond me. And he's a thousand percent correct. We don't need gun control. What we need is school safety. That's what we need. Instead of obsessing over the weapons that are used, obsess over how do we make schools completely and utterly safe. And that's why I think his organization is dead on. Americansforclass.org. Uh, I think he's dead on. Look, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Schools are the soft underbelly of American society. Why? Because they're basically gun-free zones. So, take the recent shooter in Texas. Okay, Dimitri Pagortsis, whatever. He stole a shotgun and a thirty-eight from his dad, was going to school every day in a long black trench coat in 90, 95 degree weather. If that's not a sign, I don't know what is. Wearing t-shirts saying born to kill. If that's not a sign, I don't know what is. Again, like Nicholas Cruz, uh, mutilating, killing uh, animals on Facebook, on social media. If that's not a sign, I don't know what is. And he goes in there and he shoots up the school. Now, to me, it's a very simple policy. Very simple policy. Okay? You don't even have, I don't want you to monitor social media. I don't want the parents to actually be parenting. God forbid they should be monitoring and looking over what their children are doing. Very simple. Put four armed personnel at every school. Four. Four. We've got all of these returning veterans. They know how to handle firepower. They know how to handle guns. Give them a good background check. Vet them properly. And then put four at every school. 
pay them if you want, put a few cameras, monitors everywhere. They can even sleep at the school if they want. They can shower at the school, whatever. Every school can make its own arrangement. But from now on, if everybody knows there are four armed personnel who know how to use a gun, protecting that school at all times, it's over. Good night, Irene. 99.99% of the shootings will stop. Why? Because a guy like Dimitri or whoever, Nicholas Cruz, whatever, knows if I come into that school, I may fire off one, two shots. After that, I'm dead. I'm dead. You won't get your 15 minutes of fame. You won't be a celebrity on social media. You won't stand there and make history and have the media go on about you for days and days and weeks on end. You know what you'll be? You'll be dead. And nobody else will be injured because you know they're armed to the teeth. It's very simple. The world has changed. We need to change with it. It's time to arm up our schools. Three, four armed security personnel. Problem solved. Forget the guns. Put in better security. Okay, my friends, it now looks increasingly like this summit with North Korea. It may not happen. Angela Anderson has all of those breaking details. She's in the WRKO newsroom. Take it away, Angela. 237 here on the great WRKO. Okay, tune in for the RKO box office cue to call Thursday on the 30s at 8.30, 2.30 and 5.30 for your chance to win a pair of tickets to see legendary Grammy Award winner Engelbert Humperdinck at the Lynn Auditorium on Sunday, October 14th at 8 p.m. Honest to God, I had no idea this guy was still alive. But apparently he is. So for tickets and information, visit lynnauditorium.com. Okay, my friends, quick reminder, this Thursday, 4 p 4.15 p.m., please join me for our Impeach Judge Feely rally. It will be held at the J. Michael Ruane Judicial Building. That's where F.U. Feely works on Federal Street in Salem. Uh, I will be there. Jeff Deal will be there. A lot of people will be there to speak. It is the Salem stop on the commuter rail if you're taking the train. Uh, the Rockport, Newberry Port line. The train station stop is five minutes away, walking distance, if that. So I hope to see as many of you there as possible. Okay. We'll take your calls, I promise. But I want to throw, as I like to say, one more log on the fire. You know, <clears throat> what have we been talking about? We've been talking about Starbucks. We've been talking about business owners not being able to, you know, say no to homeless people or drug dealers or drug users from using their premises, using their establishment, their bathrooms, etc. Uh, just essentially a breakdown of sheer will and in some sense law and order in our country. And we've got to reverse it. Well, it starts at home. Everything ultimately starts at home. Listen now to this story. This, you want to talk about where America is heading. Listen now to this story. True story. It's not from the onion. It's not a spoof. Listen now to this. It's based in upstate New York. A couple in New York State, listen to this, have now been forced to take their 30-year-old son, Junior, to court, to evict him from their own home. Mark and Christina Rotondo, hope I'm pronouncing their last name correctly, now say that their 30-year-old son, Michael, listen to this, apparently doesn't hold down a job, doesn't want to hold down a job. In fact, they've tried to get him to work. He can't hold down a job. He keeps quitting because he doesn't want to work or he's being fired because he's so lazy. So he's at the house. He's mooching. He doesn't want to work. He's not paying rent. He doesn't even want to help out. According to them, when mommy or daddy come home, say, from their equivalent of stop and shop or market basket, he won't even go to the driveway to take the grocery bags into the house. He won't mow the lawn. He won't take out the garbage. Michael does absolutely 
nothing. And so they finally said, this is, this is killing our son. I mean, it's killing us, and it's killing our son. He's 30 years old, for God's sakes. Get a life. Get a job. Junior, do something with your life. So listen to this. In February 2nd, 2018, they asked him to leave. They said, son, you, you got to go. I mean, you're 30. You got to get a job. You got to live on your own now. And come on, you got to, you know, you got to grow up. He refuses to leave the house. So they, for whatever reason now, they can't kick him out of the house. How can't you kick your own son out of the house is beyond me, but let that go. They have to get a lawyer. And the lawyer says, no, no, you have to give him official notice. So they send this letter, quote, Michael, after a discussion with your mother, we have decided that you must leave this house immediately. You have 14 days, they're giving him two weeks, to vacate. You will not be allowed to return. We will take whatever actions are necessary to enforce this decision. So they actually send him a certified letter on, you know, legal letterhead with their lawyer and Mark and Christina Rotondo. They keep sending more eviction notice letters. It goes through the entire month of February. No, 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 no. <laughs> he won't leave. So now, and he's claiming that it's illegal and unethical for them to remove them, to remove him from their house. So they send a follow-up letter. <laughs> you are, this is straight to Michael now. You are hereby evicted. I won't give out the address. They do in the story, but I won't give out the address. You are hereby evicted from 408, whatever, New York, state of New York, effective immediately. You have heretofore been our guest. There is no lease or agreement that gives you any right to stay here without our consent. On the advice of our lawyer, we have decided to grant you, isn't it, is up to 30 days from the date shown above, February 13th, to remove your possession and vacate the premises. A legal enforcement procedure will be instituted immediately if you do not leave by March 15, 2018. I don't want to go on, but they're basically, <laughs> they're basically saying, look, son, you don't pay rent. You're not a tenant. We don't have a rental agreement, a leasing agreement. We don't have some kind of a contract. You're our son. You're 30. You won't hold down a job. You don't want to work. You don't want to do anything. Son, get out. He still refuses to go. So then, five days later, they send him another letter. Listen to this. And in this letter, they offer him cash. They're now looking to bribe Michael to leave the house. I swear to you. Listen to this. Quote, in a letter dated February 18th, they didn't just give him cash. They also even give him advice on how to exist and navigate outside the home. Like, you got to flee the nest now, son. Son, <laughs> we want to be empty nesters, okay? <laughs> It's time for you to go, son. So listen to this. Quote, there are jobs available even for those with a poor work history like you. Meaning, you know, poor guy keeps getting fired. Get one. You have to work, exclamation point, says the letter. And they go on to say that they're going to give him $1,100 to help him get set up in the apartment of his choice, then the mother in the letter says, and also, not only should you get a job, but it's important to be, I swear, quote-unquote, organized in life, Michael. And you need to sell stuff. Your video games, your stereo, everything that you don't, that's not important, so you can raise some money, so you can pay your rent, and then hopefully you'll look for a job and find a job, son. So, what they're essentially telling them is this. You're no longer 12. You're 30. You're a mooch. You're a sponge. You won't work. You won't get a job. You won't pay rent. You won't help with the dishes. 
You won't take out the garbage. You won't mow the lawn. You do absolutely nothing. Son, it's time for you to grow up. And what is incredible is that they can't evict their own son from their own house. And my question is a simple one. If it's your children and they're above the age of, let's say, 21, for the sake of argument, if they're a nuisance to you, how can you not kick them out of your own house? What the hell is happening in America? My question to you is this. Do you have children who refuse to leave the house? They're in their late 20s, early 30s. And is this a symptom of the millennial generation? Because if it is, we're all in big trouble. 251 here on the great WRKO. Okay, very interesting story on the Drudge Report yesterday. You have a couple in upstate New York. They have a son, Michael, 30 years of age. Just doesn't want to work. Can't hold down a job. Refuses to hold down a job. So he's just, he's a layabout. He just does nothing. He's 30. He's at the house. He's eating. He's living for free. Won't pay rent. Won't do any chores. They won't cut the grass. Won't take out the garbage. Won't, won't help with the, I mean, nothing. He just does nothing all day. Now they're trying to get him out of the house. But according to New York state law, you can't even kick your own children out of your house when they're 30 years old. He's got to get an eviction order from a judge. So my question to you is this. What do you do? And do you have children like this? I mean, really, like, is this now something that is happening with more frequency among millennials in their 20s now, in their early 30s, they just won't leave. Now, look, don't get me wrong. I love my children. I love them to death. I really do. If they want to live with me, and I've said this, you want to live till you're 25, 26, 27, 28, 20, I really don't care, but you got to have a job. I mean, I, I want you to work. You know, that's number one. And God forbid, you know, you're unemployed or you just lost your job. Okay, that happens. You got to look for another job. And yes, you got to help around the house. You know, mommy and daddy are going to be getting up in age. You got to help out mommy and daddy. So you want to stay, stay, fine, we love you, but you got to, you know, you got to carry your own water. You got to start helping out. What do you do with a child that refuses to leave the house? And if it's your house, if you want to kick them out, why can't you kick them out? Am I wrong? 617-266-6868. Brittany says they should just change the locks. Brittany says there's a very simple solution here. Change the locks, and uh, Michael will have to fend on his own then. Just, just change the locks. Should the parents change the locks? Carlos, you're up next. Thanks for holding, and welcome. Hey, uh, Carlos Hernandez, running for Congress. Uh, Carlos, what's your official position on this issue? <laughs> uh, he, should, he should have been on a long time ago. Look, I have my, uh, one of my daughters, when she turned 18, I actually told me, uh, Dad, you know, I'm 18 now, so I'm older. So I can do whatever I want. I said, sure, hon. You can do whatever you want. Just basically, but I don't have to feed you. I have to let you live here. And I, oh, no, Dad. See, this is, this is wrong. Uh, my kids work very hard. Uh, they actually, my oldest daughter is actually paying for, uh, her master's, uh, in analytics to actually, uh, you know, on her own. Then she works a job at the same time. The, what we're teaching our kids is basically to be a bunch of, uh, uh kids that basically deserve something that, which basically that you, they don't fight for anything, Jeff. And, and this is crazy. How in the world could we have this? No, Carlos, look, I agree with you, and thank you for that call. Look, I mean, the kid's a sponge. He's what we used to call a bum. You know, like, you just, you don't do anything. Like, you're 30, you're a grown man, and you're not doing anything. And, um, look, I, I can just speak for myself. When I got married at 26, I went to undergraduate school. After that, I went to do my master's. I went to pursue my Ph.D. coursework. 
I, when I was 21, 22, honestly, I couldn't wait to get out of the house. Not that my parents were bad. I love being with my parents. But I'm like, I want to start getting educated. I want to start working. I want to start making my way in the world. And honestly, by 24, 25, I'm thinking like, look, mommy and daddy have worked hard. Mommy and daddy made a lot of sacrifices for myself and my younger sister. I don't want to sponge off of them anymore. I don't. You know, I, thank you. I love you. I, you have no idea how grateful I am, but I want to start making my own money and I want you guys to start, you know, planning for your retirement and enjoying life a little bit. You deserve it. So to me at 26, I couldn't wait to get married. I got married at 26 and we had a very small apartment. We didn't have very much, Grace and I. We got by on barely a thousand dollars a month, but we got by and eventually I got a job and then she got a job and you know, you, you make your way in life. But now, look how they're coddled. I mean, and it's destroying their character. This guy, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know him, but I'm just from everything I'm reading. You're 30 years old. You cannot hold down a job. And where's this sense of shame? Like, just honestly, just to me on a human level. At 30, your parents are sending you eviction letters. Like, what chutzpah on this kid? You know, where's your pride? Like, look, mommy and daddy are telling me as politely as they can, get out. Get out. And that's not registering? Like, just as a matter of pride. I'm thinking, like, you know, I'm 30. I don't do anything around the house. Now my parents are kicking me out, but I'm not going to leave? Ay, ay, ay. Ay, ay, ay. You know, I mean... <laughs> I mean, really, uh, the only time I saw stuff like this was in the former Eastern Europe. I mean, sorry, the former communist bloc in Eastern Europe. I remember my cousins, you know, they were all red diaper babies. They were brought up in the communist system. They're 30, 35, 40. They don't have a job. They're still living with their parents. And I'm thinking, guys, I even told them that. I go, guys, at this rate, live with your parents and then retire. I go, what kind of a life is that? He's 30. Kick him out. And if the law won't let you, too bad. It's my house, my rules. Am I wrong? Neil in Brockton. You're up next. Go ahead, Neil. You're so right. You're so, I've been saying that for the longest time. You need rifles. You need uh, personnel who uh, are retired military. Like I was in 60 through the 68, uh, Jeff. You know, it's so wrong out there. You got these guys... These children are going to school for education. You need these guys. They, we're on the same page, Jeff. Anyway, that's how I feel. I feel that that's what you need out there, what you said a minute ago. I've got military personnel who are retired. Let them do a job. I talk. I go to the VA hospital in Brock, and I do the same thing all the time. I try to talk to these vets. Let's go do it. Let's do it. The only way you're going to stop it, Jeff. Neil, I agree with you. And look, I, stop it, Jeff. and, and, and Neil, way, you, buddy, you served in the military? I'm 62 or 60. I was reserved. I never saw combat. I'm 73 now. That's okay. But I mean, my wife's sitting next to me. I said, that's the only way you're going to stop it, Jeff. You got, by the way, don't put it with pistols. You got guys with rifles. Stand in front of the schools, walk around. I've been saying that for a long time. I agree time. with you. Neil, I want to thank you. Yep, I go to be twice a week, Jeff. Neil, I want to thank you for your guys. service. These guys will stand with me. Oh, I they know that. Will. Neil, I want to thank you for your service, and God bless you. Look, you're completely right. Look, uh, quickly. I got, my kids are going to school now, right? I get a letter from them. They want a fundraiser to improve security at the school. I say, fine, I'll cut you a check. Are you planning to put armed security guards, you know, former vets? No, 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 no. We want to have a better alarm system. We want to have a better uh, response system. I'm like, no. Put a guard, it's a smaller school. Put one guard in the front, one guard in the back. That's it. What a rifle. An intimidating presence. A former vet. Nobody will think about shooting that school. Problem solved. Instead, it's gun control, gun control, gun control. Where did the three hours go? I gotta go, my friends. Jeff Cooner, Boston's bulldozer. Together, we're cleaning up the liberal bull. The Cooner Report is powered by Kelly Financial Services. 888-800-1881. Get the peace of mind that you deserve at Kelly Financial Services. 
The voice of Boston is you. 680 WRKO Boston, 100.7 WZLX HD2 Boston. And iHeart Radio Station.